This is for the nerds. This is for the brainiacs. This is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back. You ain't gonna touch me. You're not gonna do nothing. You are not above me. I bet you wish you was me. I know this that I'm the nerds. This is for the brainiacs. This is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back. I know it. I know. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to episode number 40 of the Solve for Why vlogcast. We are in for a spicy one today. I just got done streaming for the last five hours. So, uh, you know what, Chin? This one's all yours, buddy. Take it away. Oh, shit. Is that a pounder? No, nah, it's, just, it's just iced tea, man. Relax. <laughs> what, 32 ounces? <laughs> These are these are the classics in Jersey, bro. Oh, uh, the old Ar Arnold Palmer, half tea, yeah, half lemonade. Classic. Yep. These are a dollar. This is the only thing left that's a dollar. Inflation's through the roof, but they keep these a dollar. Yeah, I remember Arizona iced teas being the uh, the popular ones when I was in high school, the cafeteria. Yeah, then at some point we switched to four locos, and then <laughs> the world was never the same. That's true. That. People trying to get lit. Yeah, I was watching your stream. It was it was weird, bro. Yesterday, I didn't really get to watch your stream. Lucky. And then everyone was messaging me this morning about, like, what happened. And I was like, oh, no. It was a bloodbath. And then, yeah. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, that sucks. I also watched the, the Phil Helmuth uh, heads-up match. So it was a weird day yesterday. Um, okay, so we have a lot of topics today, actually. Um we have, of course, the Phil Hellmuth match. We have Venetian is firing up some stuff. Elon Musk is talking about Dogecoin every day. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't even know where to start, man. Let's start. Let's start with. Uh, let me check my list. So let me see. I'll give you. I'll give you some options, Berkey. You you tell me where you want to start. We can start. Hmm, we can start with Phil Hellmuth. We can start with. The win going nine-handed, which is kind of boring. Uh, Elon Musk on so on Saturday Night Live. Or we could start with your stream from yesterday and today. I mean, I feel like we just get the old Elon bit out of the way. Although I do think that <laughs> Helmuth Negreanu probably deserved the marquee spotlight here. I I okay. Let, let's start with let's start with Helmuth and Agrana because that's what everybody wants. Everybody, everybody's here for that. You know, a lot of people tuned into your stream and now they're here. We're talking about it in the chat. Okay. Listen. So the messages today in my phone, right? They're like, he won five straight. Stop saying he can't play poker. He beat Daniel Cates. He beat Doug Polk. He won five straight. And I'm like, I just wrote back to everyone. Hashtag results, hashtag results, hashtag results. And honestly, I'm getting tired of this shit, man. Like, first of all, somebody needs to play him. Olivier Bisquet was losing his shit on Twitter today. Once again, he's like, who's going to, why don't they let a heads up specialist play for real, for real money? And then fucking poker go, like, tweeted back at him with the fucking rule book of the of high states. They were, they were like, listen, like we pick whoever we want. <laughs> and like, um, but okay. I do want to talk about it yesterday because all, even my messages today, this morning were like, Oh, you think he's tight. He was three betting with nine, five offsuit. And like, he was going hard as fuck. And I don't know how to describe this to you. Like, you you have to know this player profile because you've played like live poker long enough that you know this player profile. He's a tight spaz. Yeah, it's fake action. Like, I, it's literally everybody that I played this app game with. They're just fake action, man. They just like I got shown seven deuce five times in the first hour and a half that I was playing, and not because we went to showdown, just because like you know I'm always at bottom, and they just see bet and win table seven. Deuce. We're not playing the seven deuce game. They're just fake yeah. action though. You know, it's just like. Yeah, they put in a bunch of money neg that's like negative EV pre, but who cares? It's a part of an assumed range that is probably positive EV, right? So it's like when you just add a few random hands into a, a, a profitable range, it doesn't matter because your opponent doesn't know you have those hands. They're just assuming you're logical. 
and that you have reasonable right. hands. And so, like, yeah, those hands don't lose as much as they probably should in theory if your opponent has knowledge that you're playing trash. But, yeah. you know, it doesn't prove prowess. <laughs> it doesn't suddenly uh-huh. make you gangster. Like, this is different. This is he's like in a he's like a worse version than this though, because mm-hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna explain right. He'll lose a pot, right? That's like a medium pot, right? He goes maybe from like 100k to like 70k, right? In the tournament chips they have, right? The next hand he's three betting nine five offsuit. Yeah, yeah. Like it's like, bro, how long have you played poker for? Right. right. Like, like you're three betting the next hand, and then he gets away with it. Because you're, you know, it's Daniel's just up. following it's the chart. Favorite. Yeah, Daniel's just following yeah. the chart. He's like, oh, I have uh, 10 6 suited, just can't raise call, fold. Yeah, and he just mucks it. Mm-hmm. Of course, that's exactly what happens. Yeah. Or he'll like peel. This happened a couple times with like deuces. Mm-hmm. He'll peel deuces to the three bet and then just have to fold on the flop because the flop came like jack 10 3 or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and then like yeah. another time he like peeled with queen jack offsuit. And against players like that, what I've noticed is that you just have to be stickier on flop. Like if you just call that first barrel more, they don't, they don't have a plan past that. Right. Right. Like their plan was they're, they're going to kind of like hit you with a little jab with this, with this shitty three bet, some random fucking spaz pre. And then, yeah. you know, they're just going to close their eyes and they're going to swing one more time on the flop. And it's like, you call and they're just like, I have nine five. Phil's five. Phil's swing is no joke though. He's throwing. Oh, he's just like bombing. Eight yeah, percent. Like, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes you know you just got the deuces and you're like, I'll pay. I, I played a hand today think... that was just obscene. It was obscene. I I raised with uh I three bet with jacks versus the the uh the one showing me seven deuce. We'll just call him that. And he calls out of position. Um, flop comes like. King, King eight X, something like that. It goes check, check. Turn is like a nine where literally no good hands exist, right? And he just over bets. And it's just like, okay, this doesn't really seem to be a thing. Yeah. And then the river is an ace and he three quarters. And I'm just like, what, what, what is going on here? What, what, like, is, what, what is this hand? What on earth is this hand? This hand is absolutely never a thing. Like it went from like him having king queen to like not having. Yeah, king and queen. also just like king queen doesn't do this. Uh, it's yeah. just, and honestly, I think what it, I think what actually happened was I see bet flop small like quarter, and he called and then just led over bet turn. And I'm just like, okay, none of this is a thing. You are just gonna have to fucking show it to me, man. You're gonna have to show it to me. I call. Oh, backdoor hearts came in too. I'm just like, whatever, wow. man. I have the jack of hearts. That's good enough for me. I call. And he's queen of diamonds, ten of spades. It's just like, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yep. Okay. Right. It's just like sometimes you just have to be like, I don't have a good theoretical hand here, but you don't have a good theoretical line. So like, whatever, yeah. man. I, I That's I a little bit of what up. actually, a little bit of what Ali Najab was saying is like, um, effectively, Daniel, I, I actually think Daniel played pretty well. Like, just watching it with no... Like, if you have no context of what's happening um, and just, like, look at the hands being played and, like, with no no audio, no visual, just, like, raw, mm-hmm. you, I think he played pretty well. Now, there were some things that I think, like, maybe could be done a little bit better, but you have to be on the streets because it's clear that Helmut is tilting. Right. And to the point where... Daniel's like saying like, oh, you're zoom zooming, like you're you have the zoomies, like you know, like just telling him straight up, like you're tilting. Yeah, you know? yeah. But it's like he's three betting you the very next hand after losing a pot, like huge, and you have deuces, like you could just rip. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. You, you just you could just rip because it's like he has like fifty bigs and he's three betting you or sixty bigs and he's three betting you. It's like yeah, it's not. But, calling is better but when well, his range includes nine five offs and maybe not maybe like folding is actually better but mm-hmm. yeah you're right like you just gotta reach sometimes and you gotta say like these cusp hands that could go one way or another like when your gut instinct says like man deuces is probably a fold for this sizing but i think he's losing it so i'm going to shift it to a call that's not the actual order of of magnitude right 
It's yeah. like, man, I think dudes is, is, is probably a fold in this spot, but he's losing it. So I'm all in. Right. Yeah. Because now you get to deny the equity of like this whole idea of keeping bluffs in only matters when you have a true top of range bluff catcher. It doesn't help when you're at bottom of range with your bluff catchers. Those are the ones that you just want to shift and say, I'm bluffing with this because it's a zero EV hand to begin with. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I agree with that a lot because it was it was really weird to watch. Helmuth won, in my opinion, because, well, obviously the last hand got very lucky. Yeah. But but before that, his his when you're playing heads up and, like, you're super aggro, like, sometimes you're just going to run somebody over. Mm. And I'm not saying he ran Daniel over, but, like, Every time he got like on the ropes, he just like came out with haymakers, you know. And yeah. it's like Daniel's just like backpedaling at that point. Like it's not really. Like, it, there's not much. In, we saw know? it a little bit in the first match too, where uh, Daniel was of the mind that once he, once he garners a reasonable lead, he can just step on the throat of an otherwise too passive player, and that's mm -hmm. kind of true. Except the problem is, with every single incremental increase in the difference between the, the the stacks Helmuth's strategy has to slightly shift more and more and more and we saw this in the first match where daniel had the opportunity to just end him right he just flops mm -hmm. that set and Helmuth had the overpair and he just had the opportunity to or sorry he flopped chip trips and and Helmuth had the overpair and he just had the opportunity to absolutely end him but he's still operating off the construct that Helmuth's game has it altered despite the fact that he's fallen from 100 BBs all the way down to like 12, right? Yeah. And he's still thinking like, Helmuth is too tight. Helmuth overfolds. Helmuth is this. Helmuth is that, right? So when he has yeah. value, he tries to eke out every single tiny little cent rather than just like putting a stranglehold on the match and burying him, right? Leaning into the fact that he gets to overbluff because Helmuth is a little bit too much of these things. And when Helmuth is finally short, he can take a stand because the risk is far less, right? So I think it's kind of the same thing. We saw Daniel jump out to a sizable lead again early in this one, and it becomes a matter of him trying to preserve, right? Where it's like, oh, I've won 30 to his 70. I'm almost a two to one favorite here. I'm just going to chip away at him, and I'm just going to increase this to 150 to 50, and I'm going to increase yeah. this to 175 to 25. But it doesn't necessarily work that way because Helmuth is going to go through incremental shifts in his strategy too, and he's going to do spastic things that recover chips versus a conservative opponent. Yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of frustrating because, like, now people were saying, like, oh, Helmuth does bluff and stuff like that. I'm like, he doesn't bluff, man. He just, like, loses his mind. And then, and then it works because he's tilting and, you know, you're saying, like, oh, he's loose, but he's not. And, and I think one of the things that's actually interesting to me in terms of Helmuth's strategy is that even though he's tight, his three bet range is actually weaker than it's supposed to be because he doesn't three bet hands like tens or sevens or right. or like it's it's or super linear. polarized and kind of like weighted towards bottom. Right. Yeah. Because like it's not like he's frequency like selecting nine five off. Like he just has like I'm not saying he has sixteen combos of nine. No, five he just off. it's a just, random spat. He just has like stuff yeah. that he's just like grabbing. Yeah. And there's only there's only a little bit of top and not just stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you actually just like weight him towards the bottom. You, right. don't, you can't define it. Right. Cause like, it's not it's ratioed just, at all. It's right. just, it's what's just his mood. Random. Right. Exactly. So yeah. like when he's three betting and you could just start deleting tens and, and suited Broadway hands, like he just has nothing. Yeah. Like, like I think four bets should actually come in more than they do and that's weird because like we think he's so tight mm -hmm. no like, you're 100 right the best response to an overly tight player is to respond aggressively we we like to think that the best response is to trap them right tighten up your ranges play trappier and then catch them whenever they are are going for thin value but the thing is they don't go for thin value right no so they don't bluff they don't go for thin value so what ends up happening is your general top of range that could otherwise be played for value turns into a bluff catcher versus an opponent that's not bluffing all you do is lose value that way all you do is play a small pot whenever you have the best of it and you play a really big pot whenever you have absolute top of range and it's not the best of it any longer if you instead 
take that linear portion of range that you would otherwise allocate to being your strongest bluff catchers and you just get aggressive with it. What ends up happening is you pick up a lot of that money where they're lost in their range construction, right? They're just lost with ace king and ace queen because they're not used to being battled back against. They're just lost with hands like jacks because it doesn't flop well post, but they're also not accustomed to facing fours, you know? So, yeah, I agree with you completely. I think that um, this is the, I mean, we talked about it a lot. Like Phil Helmuth wins because we let him win collectively as a, as a group. Now, for what it's worth, I think, yeah, as a community, like we've allowed him to do this for years and nobody is doing anything to stop it because everybody thinks they're smarter than the last guy and know how to beat Helmuth. Or they just like dismiss him as being irrelevant and don't bother adjusting whenever he's in a game. Uh, that said, I think Daniel played pretty well. And I really, really loved the tweet uh, thread that he put out today. Basically talking about, uh, you know, how early on in his career, he just never lost heads up matches. And, you know, in the last five or six years, whatever, it's kind of come back to um, turn around on him. And some of that is just a byproduct of variance, obviously, right? Like to not lose heads up matches early in your career largely means nothing. But he was almost certainly the superior player because the field was very weak back then. To largely lose your heads up matches now probably doesn't mean anything either, but it's likely that he was the inferior player in a lot of those situations. Uh, you know, when he played Bonomo, when he played Dan Coleman, these guys were heads yeah, up. Yeah, I also just, like, I, I saw, I read an article today by uh, David from Chip Race. Mm -hmm. um, it was, like, a pretty popular article just, like, kind of displaying how, like, the losing streak that Daniel's on. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a little bit unfair, though, because it was, like, he kind of just described, like, he's just lost every heads up battle for the last 10 years. And the, but all of these are tournaments. Right. Um, and describing it as losing, like is not fair because at the end of the day, like your goal in the tournament is not to win the tournament. I think people forget that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, the goal is to just like maximize EV. So in the article, it was like, Oh, he like lost all these, in fact, they didn't say like he lost all these heads up matches. He just said they he lost, right? And it's like, yeah, he lost, but he won a lot of money finishing second, right? And also like, or, or and yeah, it's like he won like twenty million over that span, right? It's like he didn't lose. Like taking second in the one drop is huge. Like that's a huge win. Like yeah. these are wins, you know. So it was a little bit unfair, but I understand. Like it was like a little bit clickbaity. Like oh, like look at the losing streak he's on. Like well, they're also uh, not. They're not very friendly with each other. So, uh, it makes sense to kind of frame the article that way whenever you dislike somebody. Um, but I thought like Daniel's thread was a little bit more vulnerable than that. Um, I think he was pretty honest, you know, about the fact that he probably was outmatched a little bit later in his career compared to earlier and that he has worked relatively hard to get back to where he is, but you're talking about, and I've said this a bunch, you know, I, I know it may have come off his shots, but I love Daniel. I think he's one of the best things that's ever happened to poker. And I would consider him to be a friend. I hope the the same is extended from his side. Um, but I've constantly said, like, I would bet on Helmuth. It's not because I don't think Daniel's good at this. And it's not even because I think Helmuth is that great. It's because of the odds, right? It's just like, right. if, if you're laying one and a half to one on somebody in a format where they're only playing 300 hands and you yeah. just have to pick the pony that run, runs a little bit faster, like... Yeah, I, I mean, sure. I think Daniel probably the has cards a, just like yeah. don't let that person lose. Like right. Philomene picked aces like yeah. five times last night, and it was like it's hard to lose when you're picking up aces. Like yeah, and that's a, not to say that Daniel won't ever like win, but it's just like I don't think his edge is anywhere close to sixty forty, right? It's like, hard to be one and a half to one, right? right. Like. It's hard to be that big of a favorite in a heads-up match. That's I might, a I, not even heads up. yeah, I legitimately might still take Helmuth at three to two versus like Olivier, and I think Olivier is significantly better suited for this format than Daniel. Like he's played it a bunch. You know, at one point he was world class at, at Hyper Sit and Goes. Um, yeah, yeah. What what were what are what are your thoughts on Olivier's kind of like uh, saying like you should let someone of this Mac like. I mean, you know, he sees, he sees a spot, right? Like he sees a spot and good for him for trying to get his way in there. Like that's, that's our job as professionals. It's like, at some point you kind of have to, you, you hate to do it, right? You hate to just turn the spotlight on yourself and say like, I'm deserving of this, that, or the other. 
But at some point, whenever nobody will listen, and they're just constantly plucking the Helmuths and the Negranus and the Esfendiaris and, you know, uh, not to lump Ivy necessarily into that crew because I think he's a little bit more specialized in the rare air than they are. Right. But, you know, still, like, the, the, the TV personas of old, whenever you're just grabbing them where this isn't their specialized format and uh, we're just seeing them kind of just, like, swing without much training... It's great product, and I understand why Poker Go is doing it. Matter of fact, right. I almost disagree with Olivier in the sense that I think it's the best version of this product. Unfortunately, right? Like, from from a fan standpoint, this is what the high stakes duel should look like. It's the best version of it. Two people who aren't precision or, or, or aren't precise in this particular format, right? You're kind of evening it out, right? You're taking you're taking two centers and making them do a free throw shooting contest or a three-point contest instead of a dunk contest right so there was there was a there was a little bit of a last night um so mj and dan smith have been playing heads up in ivy's room yeah five hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah and they asked to like if people wanted to see this on poker Go, mm -hmm. right the community said yes, uh, so they tried, and they. It seems like there were there wasn't availability, right? It's like it's one of. I mean, I, that's understood to me. Like it's like they probably have a schedule of like when they could use this studio. It's, it's a good problem like, for PokerGo to have whenever they're actually but, able to refute action. Um, and then the comments on MJ's thread. Mm -hmm from the the community was like yeah like like or was it brett hanks thread like either one like the exchange was one where the community like like the hardcores were like why the fuck would we want to see Helmuth when there's like five hundred thousand with two people that actually like are probably good um so i think it's like a polarizing topic where it's like i think there's like the hardcores that are that want to see like a match of like of of tacticians and then there's people that want to see like their favorite player you want to know, you know why the latter wins out Go ahead. it's because in the former scenario what should happen as an audience member is just applause no matter what the results are right it's just a tip of the cap to two very talented individuals who are good at a format that's not what mm -hmm. occurs, though. That's not how people watch poker. People right. watch poker and they criticize everything. Every single little mm -hmm. tiny thing, right? So mm -hmm. if you get two people... Uh, like, even that hardcore group that you're talking about, some collection mm -hmm. of that dismisses both MJ and Dan Smith as being competent at heads up, right? right. There's right. some core competency that's necessary to be a heads up specialist. And mm -hmm. MJ and Dan Smith are probably just breaching that territory, right? They probably just right. barely have the the baseline necessary yeah, not a lifelong heads right up pro. right they're both ring players uh and dan leans more tournament than cash um so it's just like you still don't get the hardcores there right you still just get the the echo chamber of criticism depending on which one's your favorite player and who you want to heavily scrutinize more with yeah. the former that's <clears throat> baked in that's why we're doing it it's a wrestling match right you're watching Helmuth and Negranu for the shit talk. You're watching it because you chose it aside already. And you're watching it because you know the plays are going to be train wrecks by comparison to watching Linus and Barry Sweet. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So or it's if just. You watch Linus and Barry Sweets, it's just going to be too. You might not even be qualified if, to talk about right. anything. Right. And that's, yeah. that's what's off putting to the audience. If we put those two in the Poker Go studio and let them play 10,000 hands, nobody would watch. Nobody. Except for like 150 people who wanted to get better at heads up. That's right. it. Because you're right. It's it's too advanced, right? You can't you can't really see the beauty in it unless you are close enough to be at least able to comprehend. And there's only a hand I mean, there's you know, one percent of poker players who are talented enough to even comprehend what's going on at the highest levels, let alone execute it, right? There's only one yeah. percent of one percent that are capable of executing it. So we're talking about just like tiny, tiny fractions of uh, a massive audience that this caters to. And it's unfortunately just not good for anybody. 
Uh, as far as like letting Olivier get in there, it's like, I like Olivier. I think he's good for TV. I think it would be an entertaining match. I think it would be great. But the problem is it's, it's a lose lose because if he beats Helmuth down the way that we expect him to, all that's going to happen is it's going to shine a massive spotlight on Helmuth's play, critical analysis, yada, yada, yada. And we'll go down that narrative again. If Helmuth gets lucky or even just like has the hotter distribution of cards. Now we have to hear the apologist and the, the kind of like, victim shaming almost of of olivier losing in his own format to uh to a lesser qualified player right so it's just nobody really wins except for the people who like to be miserable and constantly criticize but at least in the helmet negranu thing uh they're both open to that criticism there were some comments of letting like us putting on mj Versus Dan Smith. Bring him in. I'll stop streaming for a couple of days. That'd be great. And um, the other thing, you were playing on stream in Texas, right? Yeah. And I, I do agree with what you're saying in terms of people being like tuning in to be critical or tuning in to, I guess, boast their own ego. Because while I was watching, I was watching your stream, the the one with like you, Lexi, Gavin, and uh, Darren Elias, right? Mm -hmm. And pretty much, those were the three pros. Of, maybe I'm missing somebody, but those were the three pros in the game, right? Um, of course, all you're all three well established, like long time pros. Um, although Lexi is probably more of a PLO cash game player than she is a uh, no limit uh, cash game player. She played a lot of PLO in New York City, like 2550 PLO. That was like mostly her game when she lived around here. Um, and of course, Darren, Darren's a beast, right? Like he's, he's going to do his thing. Um, but all the messages I get are based around Berkey is calling three bets with ace seven suited and like <laughs> and i'm like yeah you know it's not great but sure like it's not great we're, we're we were 500 big blinds effective yeah they leave that part out of course yeah you know yeah. Like, <laughs> like you'd rather me have six seven suited it's a no-brainer right and then the other the other thing is like Oh, like 50, 100 is not that tough. Like all these people are like, look at this, like this is a joke, like whatever. And I'm like, I try to explain nicely to people that if you walk down to the Bellagio, this, this is not the game you're going to see at 50, 100. Like this is not like you're going to have seven pros and likely two people that are not pros, right? You're not going to have three pros and five people that are not pros, right? It, it doesn't, that's usually not the ratio. Maury's not going to be sitting with you at Bellagio. Right. Like, like Maury's there because he's part of Poker Go and he's trying to like have fun while he's in Texas and like stuff like that. Like he's trying to splash that and, and maybe win. But I think people forget, like, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure where the disconnect is. Like, why don't people understand that TV games are not real games? It's not just TV, man. There is this certain level of hubris that up-and-coming poker players develop. So uh, there was a conversation I had with a friend in Texas where we were at one of the other card houses, and I was playing 50-100 there. And this place is a madhouse, right? Like, it's just insane. And I'm getting these texts saying, like, I can't take this anymore. Like, there's no such thing as ranges in this game. I just saw 9-4 off, get 4-bet, yada, yada, yada. And I'm thinking, like, right. what's the problem? And mm -hmm. uh, I tweeted out a picture of a 9-way all-in pre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw a that. A 9-way all-in pre at 1-3. Like, 9 good hands have never been dealt out at the same time in the history of poker. <laughs> right. And like, they just, they're all just rocketing it off. Right. So they get a nine way all in pre where it wasn't like pre discussed of like, we're going to run a cold hand. No, 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 no. Everybody willfully decided to say YOLO pot odds and got it in. 
Okay. In that thread, a lot of people were sitting there saying like, this is just bingo at this point. Like I want to play a game where people are playing real poker and like, this is, this is bullshit, man. I didn't come to the casino to gamble. Like what the fuck is wrong with you people? Yeah, where, I, lo where did you lose that? Yeah. I love finding equilibrium, but you've been watching too many of his goddamn videos. Like forget staying balanced. If people are in a casino and are willfully giving it away where nine human beings decide that they're going to put it all in and one of them has Kings and it's the best hand. No one even had aces. Nobody is, even is, had is it aces. Our fault, though? Is, is it, is it the training community's fault? Because, like, uh, I mean, we're, we're... Just, listen, like at the end of the day, there are two major segregations in this community, right? Just like every other major competitive arena. There is the upper echelon nosebleeds elite that you'll see in all sports, you'll see in chess, you'll see in any mind game, poker, whatever the case may be. And the game is played incredibly different at that level than it is in your general amateur arena, right? Yeah. A baseball game is played far differently when you have two MLB teams competing against one another than it would be at the D3 college level, period. And the D3 college level is going to be a hell of a lot further ahead than you're going to see at a little league game. Well, yeah. in poker, these things aren't segregated by age and weight and physicality and all these other things, right? It's just a matter of what lineup gets curated together that's going to mm. dictate how the game plays. So yeah. yes, to some degree, when we're always harping on what is optimal at equilibrium versus a perfect opponent, we are kind of pushing a narrative that is just false to reality. The fact of the matter is poker has never been healthier than it is right now. And it's because of games like Texas where there are nine people going all in and range construction just isn't a fucking thing. I say this all the time to students whenever they come and they complain about like being too much action or getting beat down by aggressive players. It's like you're too goddamn risk averse. If I offered yeah. you $250,000 tomorrow to beat Zenga poker over 100,000 hands, you would find a fucking strategy that did it. Period. Right. Because it's it's not like the game is unbeatable based off the fact that no one cares, right? You care. Yeah. You're incentivized to find a way to win. I'm giving you a quarter million dollars to win over 100,000 hands. You have to win one big blind over 100,000 hands. Develop a strategy. <laughs> You'll do it. it. Yeah. You'll do it. I don't care if that strategy is only playing aces over 250,000 hands. Or, or, or sorry, yeah. over 100,000 hands, right? I think that's a lot of what happens, right? Like these games... um like the LA, the Texas, the Floridas, the New Jersey's, like the North Jersey, LA, North Jersey games, especially where I grew up, like it's very multi-way splashy action where it's like normal open sides are not real. Like it, it you know, the higher you go, the different it is, but like you're, you're playing two five, like people are not opening to $15. People are opening to $25, $30. That's the open mm -hmm. period. Like, yep. That's not like out of normal, like that's a very normal open. And if you don't open to that, you're going to go six ways to the floor, like period, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what happens in these games is people like, people don't teach to those games, like, right? right? Like we were teaching to those games when we first started, right? We were like, oh, like this is our life. Like we leave, we live in these games. Then the game kind of shifted, and I think maybe that's why people in Texas love us so much because maybe they found us when we just started. Yeah, right. You want to know what the two problem. biggest problems that the collective community struggles with right now, and no training is addressing it. I mean, we're trying to lean in as much as we can, but uh, it, it's just anecdotal. Like we just have to give our thoughts on what makes most sense from a broad stroke spectrum. The two most complicated scenarios that people find themselves in in these open public games is one, C betting out of position, and two, playing multi-way pots, period, yeah. right? And the, why? Because 100% of the training material is you're in position versus a big blind defense, or you're out of position in a three bet pot. Yeah, right. so either you're out of position as the defender, you're always either out of position as the defender, or you're in position as the aggressor. The only time that changes is if like you're the small blind three better. And we, we have some study on how that plays. But generally speaking, it's geared towards 100 big blinds where SPR is like five. And it's not that complicated to come up with strategies at that, t at that point. We need to be able to promote strategies to our, our, our community 
that say this is what you do in an uncapped 1-3 game when you're opening under the gun and you face a button defense and SPR is 30. Right. This is how you construct a check race strategy and a C-bet strategy, especially when that range is capped and wide as fuck and they have certain think- tendencies. You know, it's like you can't take the meta out of live poker, man. It's a really big element. Right. I think the question is going to be just like, well, what computer did you use to to run that, right? And it's like, you're going to need a really big computer if, you're, if these are the stack depths, right? And like the ranges are very wide because like, especially you, you're saying like, oh, you have to open a range that's like symmetrical in all spots or at least very similar in all spots, right? So you're opening UTG with like a wide range um, or wider than normal range, right? Well, you don't and, have and, to, you're just incentivized to if people aren't adjusting, right? Like I said this on stream today, Somebody was like, if you just played tighter, wouldn't you smash this game? It's like, you're just being results oriented. I've been smashing this game. I happened to have a bad day yesterday. But if we recognize that a player to our left is playing 60% of hands and we are in a position to construct a range, should we then just continue with a, a quote unquote GTO opening range? Well, first of all, no, because the equilibrium has changed. He's not responding game theory optimally, right? So yes, if we if we went ahead with that range, we would make money because it's just naturally winning. And it might mm. even be winning slightly more due to the fact that he has too many hands. However, the easiest way to exemplify this is if we have an opening range, uh, or, or sorry, sorry, sorry. If we are to the left of somebody who's opening 60% under the gun, and under the gun one is supposed to three bet, let's say 13.5% versus an under the gun opening range, right? If we mm. know he's opening 60%, are we still only supposed to 3-bet 13 and a half? No, of course it'd not. It would be fucking insane, right? Right. It would just be clinically insane to let a guy open over half the hands he's dealt in first position and just like look at a hand like King-Queen off and muck it. No, that's crazy. It would be, it would be nuts. So of course you're going to expand your ranges. That's absolutely the path to profit. You know, you just don't want to go wider than they're going. You don't, you don't, if they have seven deuce, you don't want to have seven, three, you want to have seven, six, you know, like playable right. stuff. And I think people take a lot of what you say, like, like one of the things like, you're, like they take what you say, like super literally, like, right. they're, like, like they're just like, oh, well, you wouldn't three bet them with five, seven suited because you have eight people behind. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We get what, like, yeah, don't be that, don't be that right. person. Like, but like we, I'm going like, to three bet them with Jack 10. Right. Exactly. Like this. You, you, you want to three bet them with hands that are going to perform decently well and also like a little bit of blockers that like won't get you four bet behind you, you know, like something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I was one of my friends told me something like this uh, recently where it was like, OK, let's say you have a player like Phil Hamuth, you know, he always throws rock, right? Like 100 percent rock. And you're like a perfect GTO bot that is just like throwing rock, paper, and scissors randomized at a perfect frequency, right? 33%. It's like, who wins? Well, it's like, you know, the answer to that, right? You just break even. Yeah. That that's, right. that's the beauty of rock, that's paper, crazy. scissors. Right? That, well, there is no, the, the only, well, the only winning counter, <laughs> the only yeah. winning counter strategy in rock, paper, scissors is an exploitative one. Right. Right. But that's crazy that the person that's just like literally just showing you their strategy, like rock, 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 rock. And the other person's like th- playing the perfect strat is just breaking even. Mm-hmm. It's like to the brain that's kind of like befuddling, where it's like, wait, this guy's strategy is bad and this guy's strategy is good, but they, there's nobody's winning. Right. You know, and so it's like, so clearly, it's 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 a lack of capitalization, right? You yeah. you just have to, uh, you have to re-exploit in those situations. You are incentivized to move off of equilibrium when somebody tips their hand, and that's something mm-hmm. I think people totally forget. It's like, yes, it's very important to understand what equilibrium strategies are. But when somebody divulges to you what their strategy is, right? They write it down on a piece of paper and they say, look, here's my strategy and it's not perfect. You are heavily incentivized to find the counter that maximizes against that strategy, even if it leads you open, leaves you open to uh, other counter exploits, right? It just becomes a, game, it becomes a game of cat and mouse of who's moving first. I think we used to talk about that a lot more. Like it kind of went in fashion and then it kind of left fashion for a little bit where we used to talk about being clairvoyant over somebody's strategy. Um, we used to talk that, about that maybe like a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, a lot more than we do now. I'm not even sure why. 
just kind of left. I, I think know, because maybe. poker kind of froze for a year during pandemic. Yeah, that's probably why. <laughs> Clairvoyance is a lot more difficult when you're online. It's like, oh, wait, we're not really playing every day anymore. <laughs> I haven't seen this person for a year. I don't know if I'm cutting white over there. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, I mean, so just to like wrap up that topic, um, like just tell the people, I guess, like, like your plans for these streams and stuff. Cause like you've had like two days of these streams. It seems like they're going pretty like, like people are enjoying it. I see the comment section. I see a lot of familiar faces and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to do it Monday through Friday. That's when the game runs. Uh, Saturdays I'm going to take off Sundays. I will try to stream, uh, WSOP MTTs. Um, I'm going to do it for the next, I guess it's like so you're streaming games. 25, like, like the games are like 25, 50, 50, a hundred games. So it's 2550, but plays much bigger. Uh, it's 2550, 10K buy-in. And the money just goes in very, very easily, like with one pair for 200 blinds. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, it is what it is. Like everybody's kind of out there figuring it out on the fly. It's a really good environment. It's very splashy. Uh, I think that my VPIP is probably second highest in the, in the game um, behind the man playing seven deuce. And uh, yeah, a lot of times like it just turns into an eight-handed game where we're playing heads up most often. Uh, and then there are other times like yesterday where I'm just kind of the the goat who's getting got. Um, I don't mean that as in G period O period A period T period. I mean like I'm the I'm the scapegoat. Um, just a lot of <laughs> a lot of second best hands. You know, just a lot of bluff catchers in spots where you're not facing bluffs and a lot of coolers. Uh, a lot of sets being no good, things of that nature. Uh, but, you know, it's going to happen. That That is variance in a nutshell. Like, what people, I guess, like, fail to understand about the chaos of this game is that the more hands that you can play without damaging your bottom line, the more volume you're able to get in against people who are losing. So if somebody is losing X amount of big blinds per 100 and you're able to play X plus 1, or, or sorry, not X plus 1, but, like, Y plus 1 more hands than your counterpart who's has a comparable win rate, your win rate is just going to slightly go up, right? Yeah. Um, I think this, that's, the, that's the legendary Garrett Adelstein uh, strategy. Yeah. But with that comes a lot more <laughs> variance because the more hands that you're adding, obviously the weaker your range becomes and the more bluff catchers you have to parse through whenever you arrive at these tougher decision points. So, you know, there's a lot of me calling and losing. And that's just a function of the game. You know, it, it's, it's going to be a, a byproduct of what happens. Um, it's scenarios where like, I have to train myself into the meta, uh, a little bit where it's like, okay, sometimes I have to start over folding a little bit. Sometimes I have to start over calling a little bit. It just depends on the player type that you're up against. And that's not a fun thought process to go through. It's not really a fun thought experiment to go to through, but it's one that I'm willing to make because I think that I can outperform what the, the straight equilibrium would do in that particular scenario without some sort of vision over field tendencies. Like, I think my observation picks up on enough field tendencies where it can skew me one way or the other. And I don't think Let that I'm like... Some, let me ask you some questions, right? Because like, I got a lot of questions while you were playing in these uh, in these Texas games, right? Uh, and they were they were built around just like strategy. And I was like, I was like, I don't know. I would, I would just... I'll tell you what I would do. Um, so like the questions came about where it's like, well, let's say because people were like discussing the, like how splashy the games were. And mm -hmm. like, and I think a lot of people like you're saying, there are very risk averse. So a lot of the questions were like, well, you can't three bet out of position with linear hands because you're going to get called. And, and if let's say, for example, you have like a queen jack suited and it goes like raise, call, call, and you're in the small blind with queen jack suited. Like if you three bet, you might, you might go call, call. And now that's bad. So you might just call like instead of three betting, but I don't think this is the thing for me. I don't think that's entirely true. Like if people are playing too many hands, there are hands that people need to fold pre. Um, so it's like you, and if they don't, and if they call with too many hands, then queen Jack, like the value of queen Jack kind of goes up again. Uh, so how are you approaching these games where it's like, it's super splashy and you have these hands that are, good three bets in theory or, or or maybe in practice but like the like you're not getting a full pre like 
like th that's not gonna happen yeah of course not uh the thing is is like all the reason why people are risk averse and don't want to three bet in that scenario is because of the equity threshold necessary to play a big pot so when you have queen jack suited you're going to need more than one pair to play an all-in pot whenever your 400 blinds effective right in theory in a vacuum where people are or have or are constructing with like reasonable ranges but in practice mm -hmm. Any game that you're in where it goes raise, call, call, and you have the opportunity to squeeze queen, jack, 400 blinds deep, it's going to be pretty effective because the whole reason that it went raise, call, call is because people play preflop trashy. So they have too many hands and they're very unprotected. Even if they're trapping with hands that dominate you, they still have to play deep SPR spots post with hands that don't connect that well outside of making bluff catchers. So even if they're yeah. calling with hands like ace, queen, ace, jack suited, like whatever, they still have to out flop you and hold on for multiple barrels right so largely this is Not why you, but like hit yeah flop yeah, enough hit. equity yeah. yes yes yeah. flop enough equity to continue so like largely speaking this is why you see so many of these wild hands from me specifically is because i understand how the equity threshold shifts when ranges aren't malleable right when ranges are just too wide to begin with and then they remain inelastic because people are playing bingo and they're just trying to flop something and then hold on, what ultimately happens is you get to leverage the last bet. And one pair, especially when you have the perception of being a maniac, just goes through the fucking roof. You just get to play like 800 and 1,000 big blind pots with aces because somebody flopped top pair and couldn't ever fold. Like I saw so many 50K pots this week playing 50, 100, where the money went in on the river on a queen high board in a three bet pot and the three better just had aces. And the, the caller just had like a hand like queen 10. So you don't want to be the passive one with the bluff catcher. You would much rather be the one pressing the action. With the, you don't want to be that fifth caller when it goes raise, call, call, and you have a queen jack suited. Because you'll never flop enough equity where you can win the pot through aggression. All that will happen is you'll flop enough equity that you can call multiple streets and hope to be good by the time you arrive at showdown. But in that same process, you're allowing many other players to realize their equity in the fullest. If you trust that you're a better post-flop player than everybody else who is literally not thinking beyond the fact of, I have X amount of equity or I don't, therefore I call or I don't, then you are just wasting your time. Just fold pre. Get out of the way. What about the, what about the argument, Burke, where it's like, oh, I don't want to blow up the pot because I am better than them post-flop? The, I mean... It doesn't matter though. It, like you don't get to press any sort of post flop edge because no matter what, pressing that edge is bloating the pot, right? To be better than them post, you have to find check raises where they won't. That bloats the pot. To be right, mm -hmm. people who say that they're better than someone else post means that they check raise two pair more often than their opponent. Like get the fuck out of here. That doesn't make <laughs> you make good. More nuts. Yeah, you make the you make the best hand more often and you bet it. Like congratulations, that does not make you a good post flop. I think player. what they mean is like. I make a hand post and they don't fold. My opponents sure. don't fold. Sure, but you know what also they mean? I can make a hand post and fold myself because I'm so disciplined. That too, yeah. yeah. And that's asinine. That is just not the proper way of playing poker. We want to shovel money into the pot as often as possible when we have equity, period. You think people are just underrolled for these games? Is that what it is? They're underrolled. They're understudied. They also don't understand multi-way facets uh, of this game and like how the pie divides. And how, how much incentive matters when up against a collection of multiple ranges, right? Like the domination factor goes kind of out the window whenever there are multiple actors. Because so many dominated hands miss and fold, right? Like just, you know, it's kind of a race to showdown in, in that regard. And the yeah. multi-way aspect of it just gives the person with initiative a massive, massive advantage in over-realizing their equity and denying the equity to the collective field. Yeah. They, they don't need to bet that often and, like, the collusion effect of all those players, like, kind of forces people to, like, underflow and things like yeah. that. Um, so it's like they just win um, a lot. And then yeah. also, if even if original razor checks, like, people are not going to be stabbing light into the field. So right. it's like... Original Razor still gets to overrealize equity. Like, right. like what you don't necessarily want to do is squeeze in that spot with tens. Because now you're going to play a four or five way pot with a marginally strong bluff catcher that isn't going to flop that well.
you know, and you can't really, That's... and you can't really handle a four bet from the original razor. But like Queen Jack suited, you don't give a shit. Right. You flop back doors, right. you flop overs, you flop gut shots, you flop draws, you flop all this stuff. And you're never married to your hand because you have nothing. Sometimes it comes Queen Jack high and you get married to your hand and you're against a lot of equity because there's nine, 10 and King 10 and all these other draws out there. But you just, you can just like fast play those spots. I saw an article this week of, uh, it was from Jonathan Little. He said like the bank rolls needed to uh, play poker. Mm -hmm. And it was, people were disagreeing heavily with his, assessment one of them was like a hundred buy-ins for tournaments um i believe cash games he was using like a 20 buy-in metric do those still exist those were those used to be the numbers right i mean those were the numbers back in the day it's pretty aggressive so if i use a hundred buy metric like i'm just going like i'm losing like a quarter of my roll on a sunday yeah i mean the thing is is that like i don't know what his assumed win rate is for those calculations to come up with a risk of ruin that's low enough to justify 20 buy-ins for a cash game. Your win rate just has to be astronomical. You have to be winning like, you know, 40 blinds per hundred, which mm. is, it's not out of the question. Like winning 10 big blinds per hour in, in live cash is pretty, pretty on par with like the best player in any one stake level. Um, yeah. But like, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You're still probably at like a 15, 20% risk of ruin if you only have 20 buy-ins. And honestly, to win that much, like to have a win rate that high means that you have to be V-pipping more than the field by a pretty large amount. You don't garner an edge that great by only playing like, you know, super tight ranges because nobody's going to pay, right? And you don't have enough hands in those ranges now to suddenly make your bluff start making money. That's the thing that I think people fail to understand is that our goal think, in poker... I think... I think, I think... I think you're respectively playing with people that are too smart. Like the lower you go, people just pay. Yeah, sure, like, fine, but like that that still that still doesn't really allow you to earn 10 big blinds per hour because you don't get to you, like if you're only playing select hands, you have to earn so much on your best right, hands okay. to make up for all of the folding that you do and all of the rake that's being taken, right? So a lot of the big neutralizing aspect of playing lower is just the rake in and of itself. It becomes mm -hmm. very difficult to be a $30 an hour winner at one three. That's not saying it's not feasible. It's just not that easy. Right. And yeah. I think like what's okay. greatly overlooked, what people don't understand is our main, a bit main uh, mm -hmm. ambition in poker is for our bluffs to break even. And by them breaking even our value now increases drastically, right? right? Our bottom line, okay massively increases and the thing is if our bluffs slightly start to lose it means our value just goes up even more right because mm -hmm. we're just facing calling stations and now it gives us the ability to shift and make our bluffs actually uh lose less because we just bluff less often right right so it's one of these games is one of these situations where like if you're in a calling station environment you're just gonna lose red line because like you can't really bluff yeah but or, but the but the your value hands are just yeah, yeah exactly exactly um yeah i think right 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 and, and we're always playing this game right of like trying to try not trying to balance out which like are our strategy and i think people just like shift too much to one side yeah <sighs> so okay so wait we didn't even answer the question so like what do we think do, do we think that that those old metrics are, are good no still? i think like... that's super aggressive I, I mean i think to be the biggest winner in your game you have to be extremely volatile you have to be able to play slightly wider ranges than everybody else you have to be in there mixing it up you have to be taking some aggressive theoretical lines post you got to be doing more check raising than others all of this stuff requires funding you know the vast majority of people are showing up to live environments and they're playing uber passively because people telegraph their hands and they're basically there to hero fold right and that's fine against the collective field. But the second that a quote unquote alpha sits down and just decides to redline you to death, you're fucked. Your win rate just got cut in half by one single player. And there's nothing you can do to adjust because you haven't trained into it. Right. Yeah. It, it's so weird. Cause like me coming from, from like playing small to big, like I would have thought like, dude, if I have fucking if you give me 20 binds at one, two, like I'm never going broke. Mm. Like 
it's just like there's no way I'm gonna lose six k in in this game. You know, three hundred dollar bullets at Bergata. It's like six k. You know how long did it take me? Like I'm just folding jacks to the three bet from Uncle Uncle Johnny over there. Like mm -hmm. he three bets me out of jacks. Like I just fold. He never bluffs. You yeah. know. So it's like I think I think it's like the lower you are in like super non volatile environments where it's like it really doesn't matter. You're playing one two like one three like you probably could get away with being massively underrolled because the volatility in the game is like none. Well, yeah, like, you're right. like, and you're also right in the sense that the strategy incentivizes you to play that way because of rake. Mm -hmm. So you actually are incentivized to fold a bunch and just like three bet right. aggressively. Right. You three bet, you open, but like you don't really, they never You bluff, just don't so defend. Don't, yeah. Yeah. You just, you just never take a passive action. Yeah. And I think that's how I won for a long time. I just like, I never call their bets mm -hmm. and they call my bets, but yeah, sometimes I'm bluffing. Sometimes I'm not, but like, I'm not calling their, they don't bluff. So I fold. Right. right. And you just like win because you're never calling. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe I think as you move up though, and I think we've spoken about this more, like the more you're getting three bet, the more people are bluffing, the more you have to call bluffs and the more volatility there is in the game, the more you're going to need a bank. Right. And I think, that's just cash like tournaments i i think pe like maybe we're skewed because live tournaments are like rare -er, right like you just don't get to realize the volume right but if you're playing online mm -hmm. you're just firing 10 tournaments a day you usually just blow through these vines like pretty fast right yeah. um and, and i'm sure that if we were like on primedope.com or something like looking at these like variance calculators, like in a tournament, like you're probably seeing some nasty downswings. Like, you know, yeah. you, especially if your ROI is not that big, like let's say you calculate, I think Ryan LaPlante shows something like if you calculate like a 25% ROI, like you could swing like heavy 150 buy-ins down, yeah. like normal. It's like, it's bad, but it's a normal downswing. Like mm -hmm. it's not something out of the ordinary. So you're just like broke. And then some, like you borrow another 50 buy-ins from your mom. Like, <laughs> You're just, like, you're just, like, super broke. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Talking about tournaments. The Venetian has added high rollers. The middle of May. 10K, two 10Ks, and a 25K. You see it here. May 27th through the 29th. What do we think, man? Venetian? Like, that's a little bit... Uh, you know, okay. Like right next door to the wind, the wind has started running some high rollers right next door. Now we see Venetian. I think the wind was in conjunction with poker go, right? Mm. I could be wrong. I don't think so. I mean, either way, it's the same, it's the same pool, right? You're going to get the same 18 to 25 players. So I guess if, they think they're feeling a need or those players have expressed that they want to play more um, and they don't have loyalty strictly to Aria or win. And then sure. It seems like it'll be. I, as I, I believe now I could be wrong, but I, I am almost certain that this, this 10 K 25 K thing is also in the middle of their like deep stack series. Yeah. But um, nobody traveling for deep stacks is playing anything at that level. So it doesn't matter. Right. Like I, yeah, I don't think yeah, that's these are very, these are very like, segregated uh pools yeah they can't right? even really get like uh they can't even really get a mass field 3k mm -hmm. like people just aren't traveling for that they're traveling for the 1100s and under i don't know it kind of feels like a know your lane spot but like i said if 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 that collective pool wants to continue gambling more they're not going to say no how much money do you think is in this 10k 25k buying range like and like a lot. First, yeah, like, my questions are always this, right? Like, it's the same people, right? It, it's, you're seeing, it, it, especially in Vegas, it's like Ali, um, Foxen, um, Sam, wait. Yeah, Sam, Sam, yeah, Sam Soverall, like, these guys every day, right? Wait. How many, okay, so what do you think the edges are for like, 
let's let's say like the best player in the pool, maybe an Ali, right? Uh, what do you think like an edge like for someone like that is? Uh, and like how much fun? Like you know, obviously like these are theoretical questions that you don't really know. But let's just take a guess. Like if you had an Ali on your hands, right? Like we have we have landed on on our on our roster, right? Yeah. Um, of people that we throw out there and try to fight people with, like. You know, he's like our, like one of our, 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 he's like the bishop, right? He's like, he's out there, like we're moving him around and like, we're trying to take over the world. Um, how, how, let's say, what do you think the ROIs are for someone like, like a, like an Ali? How much fun do you think someone like that needs? Let's say like before landing, right? Trying to break in. And is it worth it in terms of, or, or just like have people playing? 1020 Bellagio and playing 1500s. Like, what, yeah. what, do you, what do you think is going on here? Um, it's tough to say, man. I, I think it varies by field. I think some of these 25Ks are wildly profitable. Like the one that just ran in Florida, you know, had 140 people. Like Ali's, mm -hmm. Ali's ROI, ROI there might be like 30 to 40, maybe even 50%. That seems outrageously high, but it seems possible. Um, in the standard, like 18 man field, maybe like 20, 25%. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know the collective field well enough and I definitely don't know his game well enough to, to judge. Um, but obviously he's winning. Either. I'm just like kind of, a, yeah. like, I'm making a leap of like, yeah, yeah. obviously he's winning. He's very good, you um, know? But like, yeah, collectively throughout all these buy-ins ranging from like 10 K to 300 K or whatever the case may be, these guys probably need between like two and 3 million a year in buy-ins. There's probably collectively... 25 to 50 players in this realm so we're talking about i don't know something in the neighborhood of i mean i guess we're talking about like 125 million in the liquidity pool per year and some percentage of the field has an roi maybe like 33 percent of the field is winning maybe half right. maybe half I mean, it's tough to say, right? Like, it can't just be the wrecks that are losing. There have to be some losing regs too, I would assume. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is 66% of the pool is just like winning and gobbling up all the money. It's very viable. Uh, if that's true, then everybody else's ROI goes down. Like, the more the more collective winners there are in the in the pool at large, the lower yeah, the, the, the available are. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, and the less available ROI per person, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's difficult to say without knowing that ratio. If, if we know that only a third of the field is winning, then it's very feasible that Ali's ROI is like 50, 60%. If we think the two thirds of the field is winning, it's probably like half of that, you know? Um, but yeah, they all collectively need a lot of money. The more of these that pop up, the more the liquidity pool gets distributed amongst venues, I guess. Um, but mm. the pool itself is so small and niche that, I don't really think this is drawing in new blood. Uh, you know, Landon will play some select ones like he did the 25K in Florida, but like they just need to be high value. He, he's going to probably play similar ones that like Shulman plays or I play or Chewy play. Like we just mm. recognize spots where we can have a plus ROI situation where we otherwise aren't studied enough to necessarily go in and bang it out in a a, a daily 15 man. You know, that's not what right, any of us are tweets. studying. Yeah, that's not what any of us are studying into. Right. Like we all have our, our, our little niche areas and the edges are just too fine there. Like even a guy like Chewy, who's studying MTT strat literally every single day and probably does have a positive ROI in like the ARIA 25 Ks and things of that nature. How worth it is it? You know, it's like, it's so skinny. The margins are so thin that he would have to either crank out massive volume, which is going to require funding and now take a hit to his bottom line because he's not going to have all of himself. Or he can just go into arenas where he has a much larger ROI and can bankroll himself and just mash. I think I, mean, I secretly think a lot of people are kind of yoloing it in these spots too. Like, yeah, I suspect it's a great place a if you're on the come up and you're trying to and you're trying to make a splash fast. It's a great spot, right? Like, right. if you ha if if you're like a Jeremiah or a Landon or whatever, where you just have like the availability to say like a million dollars. And you're just like, okay, well, nothing is going to change for me if I woke up tomorrow and I was a broke college kid. So I'm going to bust my ass study and just like get in here and see if I can just win 10 million fast. It's a great spot. Like when you're in your thirties and you've been doing this. The sunset. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you know, when you're in your thirties and you've been doing this for a long time and it's your million, 
it's uh it's not quite as good of a spot to just like fire it off a lot of millionaires now mm. everybody's a millionaire this mm -hmm. is crazy we're in a new world a whole new world <laughs> they give out all these all these checks in the mail and now everybody's a millionaire mm -hmm. you know we're talking about checks in the mail Elon Musk is supposed to be on Saturday Night Live this weekend in two days. Okay. The rumor is that he's going to take Doge to the moon. Mm. The Even if he, that was him prepping for Saturday Night Live. That was a Saturday Night Live tweet. I don't know what's happening, man. I haven't put any money into Doge. Me either. But I get so many text messages every day, mostly from some nice mamacita. Yeah, Yo, you're popular, man. You get a lot of text messages. People are coming to you for answers. I mean, you're the you're the guru. Look where I'm at, bro. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, you're in the Google headquarters basement, still locked up, chained up. Yeah, I'm just here answering messages. Why is why is Bertie Stubby with K9 Spades? I'm like. King I don't know. Is, oh. oh, King Eight is like. Send me the link. Send me the link. Because <laughs> like, that's a range card for me. Like, you just jam that river. Okay. So then it was okay. So then okay. So he's supposed to be on Saturday Night Live. If he mentions Dogecoin, this thing might go ballistic. So we just so our, so we just point, we man. just like buy a hundred k today and just see what happens. Ah, just sell it man. off Monday. This is the chart. This is insane. <laughs> what, what are we this, at? 72 cents? We're at 72 cents? All right. So like, I mean, it's got, it, it can't keep up. All right. So we buy in at 72 cents. We buy 100K worth. And then we just sell it on Monday. Hope it's like $1.10. Monday? That shit might be a 10 cents by Monday. Right. We might have to sell it like <laughs> Sunday morning at 1 a.m. Bro, we're going to have to be on the fucking computer as Elon is talking, bro. Mm -hmm. As soon as he's doing the opening monologue, just like ready, just like <laughs> this is the craziest shit I've ever seen, bro. Like we don't know, man. What if he comes out and he goes, "Dogecoin is a meme, sell." It's just, over. Poof. Yeah, it's over. Like he just liquidates this his thing, position like, right before the monologue. I don't understand this. Like I feel like we live in a weird world where, first of all, like if people don't understand Doge, like, and I know people don't understand it. Because it's like, there's no way. They're just like buying in, but they have no idea of like the fundamentals or anything. It's like, there's an infinite supply of Doge. Right. An infinite supply of Doge. Like, yeah. It's like XRP. Making... No, it's like worse, man. They're making a million Doge coins a day. Oh, it's like 10,000 yeah. a minute. It's okay. like something ridiculous. Yeah, right? I know so it's XRP like... does like a million a quarter, I think. Right. Doge is just like, it's it. It's not normal, right? It's like, it, it, it's a joke. It's supposed to be a joke. Yeah. Right, so there's no way it could keep up this kind of a of, of a situation. And this isn't financial advice. I don't want anybody to assume you're nothing. Right, right. But like, it can't get to ten dollars because no, it would no, just no, naturally no. inflate. It it just you know it goes through hyperinflation. No, basically. it can't. You're gonna need to like it, it just can't. Like it, it's it's a too 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 much of it's an inflation. It's like uh, it, it's similar to what's that currency? Was it in not Portugal? Zimbabwe or something? No, no, no. It was a South American country where it's literally just littering the streets. Like, they just throw their money on the streets because it's so fucking worthless. Uh, Venezuela, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was Venezuela. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Their entire streets are just littered with money. Littered. Like, they're they're more worthless than the penny. So the thing is that what I... This is a thing, like, that I'm really noticing, right? Is that we're entering a world where... There's a lot of money, right? Just like, like the average household today has like, it's like peak money of yeah. all time, right? Some of it is because like we're stuck in our house, so we haven't spent money for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part is like we're getting checks in the mail, so like the average household is still going up. Wow, this is crazy. <laughs> but those of you that are watching, uh, we just put, we just put the dollar. What was it? What did you say it was? I think it's Venezuela. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Venezuela's dollars on the street. And also, we're in an age where, like, information is, like, kind of flying. Yeah. And this new... Well, influencers like just cool. have a massive impact on markets now, which wasn't yeah, it's like a thing. Cool to invest now. 
mm-hmm. because I think like Robin Hood and these kind of like they they kind of made it like a game. Yeah, yeah. Where it's like yeah. where it's like oh like like yo let's buy this and like sh- like let's see if we could take it to the moon. Yeah, you know? yeah, and, like, yeah. And, and and it's like oh you got rat and you know like <laughs> it's like and then you like have these like forums like Wall Street bets right where it's like you kind of brag when you when when you do well and then the times you get wrecked you kind of get like it's cool to get wrecked like badge of honor actually, yeah it's like a badge of honor it's like mm-hmm. oh you got wrecked like oh come back again next time mm-hmm. you know and it's like so you're you're putting out these like big bets like but it's a game mm-hmm. so now and then now people are like they form teams you know and it's like oh well if we all get together we could fucking take down these bad guys on wall street you know, and it's like, and then they just like short squeeze GameStop. And it's like, but I don't know, man. Like, I think at some point, like, people are going to get, like, I don't know. This ghost shit, like, really kind of scares me. Everybody's it's like, a genius in a bull market, right? Like, you can't help but make money right now if you have money. Right. But like, you know, yeah. you have to, you have to use a little discretion because the other shoe is going to drop. Just like we saw in 2017, altcoins are going to turn to shit coins and very, very, very quickly. So yeah. hold on to some stables, hold on to, you know, some of the, the currencies that we have faith in, whatever the case may be, some assets, whatever. Yeah. Uh, I'm terrified. My house has doubled in value in three years. I'm mortified by that prospect because I just don't think that it's worth what the sticker price is right now. But, you know, it allows me some leverage. If I want to take out a second mortgage, suddenly I went from being a couple hundred thousand in positive equity to like a half a million. But so this is like, kind of what happened before, where it's like everyone was happy because they were paper, like paper rich. Right. And yeah. then all of a sudden, right. like collapse. Everyone got, you just get deleveraged because yeah. like you just get fucking wrecked. Like the, yeah. everything goes down, like you have, you get liquidated. Yeah. There's never, like, there's never a more critical time to prepare for the future than right now. I think people do it the opposite. People get like really conservative in bear markets where it's just like, I don't know where I'm going to make my next dollar. I got to cut my spending. I got to be really conservative. I got to put some money here and some money there. And I got to create a living will and all this other stuff. Fuck no. Like do it now while the money's rolling in, right? Find some stable assets that you can invest into that aren't going to move all that much if we see some crashes around the around the way. And I should take my own advice because I'm certainly not doing this. <laughs> not to the degree that I should. I have way right. too much fiat for sure. Like for sure, I just have the fact that I have cash at all is way too much cash. Period. I have right. way too much crypto, uh, but I believe in it, so it's really hard to like. I j- I actually you just want to, yeah. Like I I just want to protect myself by making more fiat so that I can put it into something more stable than crypto, just in case there is a crash. Yeah. And then you know it's like I have resources like the business and the house and stuff like that where it's like it could go one of two ways. Like everything's great now. But like literally, if we saw some sort of like famine, uh, uh, like an economic famine, everything that I currently possess could crash. But that's the nature of markets, right? It's like there Mm. is no real safe bet unless you were like able to get in early on an Amazon or an Apple or or maybe even Tesla. But I'm not even so sure that these companies are all bulletproof, right? It's really difficult to forecast the future when it comes to this kind of shit. There are going to be winners and there are going to be losers. And the winners are almost always certain to be the luckier ones. It's not that the losers are dumb. Sure, some of the losers will be the unfortunate ones that either didn't protect themselves when they had the opportunity to do so or made really bad fucking bets, right? Like they just yeah. fired off all their net worth into Doge and it got wrecked as predicted, right? Dude, the dude, the, like it was, fam- it was a famous article. Dude fired everything he had. He put everything he had. He had his life saving 150K. It was, like, it was famous on YouTube right now. Mm. Fired it all on Dogecoin. He has like 1.5 million as of like last week. Can now now probably has more. Cash and he was like, and they they had like huge, like multiple major YouTube channels interviewed him. Like, and he was like, I'm not selling. Yeah. And that's he the was, thing. It's just like, bro, yeah. just take 300 for your time. You know, take 20% yeah. for your time. That's it. You, no matter what happens, you will have doubled your initial investment. And that is worth a lot. Like that is one thing that I will say that I've been good enough to do along the way is I took profits largely because I needed to, you know, but, but nevertheless, like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm free rolling all of my investments, which is worth a lot, at least from a sound of mind standpoint. Yeah, for sure. I mean, 
It's one of the reasons why, like, I've been hesitant with altcoins. I'm just like, man, I've been here before. Yeah. <laughs> I had here. so many e in 2017. <sighs> yeah, but it's like, you know, I like, had I like know. 500 when it was like 200 bucks. Yeah. Well, I have zero. What are you going to do? What, what are you going to do? do? What are you going to do, man? I mean, I think we have to be thankful for the things that we do have now because it's like... Oh, God, yeah. I, it's not that I have zero because I just like took cash. I put it all into Bitcoin. So like I still did right, okay. Right. So it's like, it's fine. Yeah, it's um, just easy to have hindsight. Yeah, I think I just wanted to bring it up because like, look, at the end of the day, it's not financial advice or whatever. I just like, I think people should be careful because like, one, I was... I was here 2017, 2018, right? Where it was like, it was just like everyone was making money and then everyone was not. Yeah. You know, it was like everyone was like firing hard. I remember being at Aria playing, dude, I was playing like maybe, maybe 510, probably 25, and just like buying Bitcoin, like a whole Bitcoin for like 17K, like mm -hmm. just like nothing, right? And then like in two months, like it's worth dust and I'm just like grinding and trying to make it back, you know? And it's like, Fire what you want, but like, you know, Elon's not going to be there to save you. He's going he's gonna to be chilling with Tesla, right? Yeah. He's, he's going to be chilling he's with gonna Tesla. He's going to be fine no matter what. That I'm saying. Yeah, like, I just I just want people to like, you know, you can gamble hard, but like, understand you're gambling, you know, like, especially with these like coins that like, yeah, I mean, the rug has to get pulled at some point. That supply is too high. Like, you know, do a little bit of research, like figure out like, you know, what's good, what's not, whatever. Um, I'm just here of, for the memes. Get man. out of the US dollar. I'm just here for the memes. The memes are real, man. The memes are real. That's crazy out there. But so what's on what's on deck uh, for the people to watch if they're not watching your, your stream? What, what, what's the release schedule looking like? Uh, stream Monday through Friday, as well as Sunday. Uh, we're going to be giving away five seats to homeschool. So be sure you tune in for details for that. Um, the giveaways are going to be each Sunday and then the final Wednesday that I stream, which will be the 19th, right before homeschool starts. Uh, giving away five total seats, one, one, and three. Um, we have Matt Hunt's course coming out on Saturday this week. Uh, we have his mastermind the following Saturday. And office hours the Saturday to follow. Homeschool, as I mentioned, does start May 25th. So we got that coming out. Uh, we just put out another uh, course of quick studies. So this is Low Limit Mistakes. That's currently up on solve4y.io. You can sign up there for free. Uh, just sign up to the free roll package. We also have the To Be Determined documentary coming out at the end of this month. It'll be on the free roll for one month. Uh, before we have to move it behind the paywall. I'll release or disclose more details to that as we get closer. Um, I think that's it. Poker Out Loud every Monday. Uh, new on Second Thought, I think, will be the first Monday in June, if I recall. And, uh, yeah, we're just cranking along, man. There's so much content that it's like, yeah, guys, like, you know, Poker Out Loud is every Monday now. It's like, whatever. It's not even a big deal anymore. Like, yeah, it costs us, like, you know, like 100000 every time we fucking film it. But whatever, it's on Monday every time. Like, no problem. It's, just, it's, just consistent. Watch it. it's like Saturday Night Give Live, man. Like. You can count on it being there, you know? Give it a like, subscribe, whatever. You know, leave a comment if you like some hands, whatever, you know? But, you know, it only costs us 100K every time we fucking turn on a camera for Fuck Out Loud. But yeah, whatever, you know, every Monday, uh, tune in and uh, yeah, have a nice, have a, have a good show, you know? That's how it is. That's, a, that, that, that's where we are right now. That's how much money is in the system. Not yet for us, but we're getting there. <laughs> All right. So, Fifty dollars a month, it's free. It's it's literally free. I, like I watched some stuff the other day. It's like they have like moving graphics of solvers and like in, in 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 like what's happening right now. Like I didn't see that in upswing. I didn't see that on run it once. That's crazy. Fifty bucks, bro. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. We're gonna have to have a meeting about this soon. Yeah, we are. Anyway. This production is gonna start charging us more. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. We're gonna have to we're gonna start this Patreon account. Mm -hmm. I've been saying it for weeks now. Mm -hmm. Patreon, you know. I mean, these things are expensive. Bro. Look, I'm drinking I'm drinking dollar fucking iced teas because we're just giving away poker a lot every Monday. We're on a budget. Anyway, let us know what you think. What coins are you guys in? Leave a comment below. I want to know what do you think is going to the moon. 
what do you think like what do you think of the price of lumber the shit is like it's like 4x if you build a house now like it just costs you money more money because the, the wood is expensive uh let us know what, what what are your coins what do you think if you think elon's gonna say dogecoin or you think he's not gonna say dogecoin let me know if you are in dogecoin like i want to know <laughs> don't come crying on my shoulder if it goes to the fucking bottom um there it is the lumber price yo these guys yo production this yo andre's on it bro like we just mentioned something it just pops on the screen but if you haven't already please like and subscribe it really does help our channel a lot and you know it does get the word out we are trying to like grow and i think you know as overall like we're doing a pretty good job i know the chip race says they're the best podcast but like i don't know man i talk to them all the time they're kind of boring like like you know they're very like inter- they're like intellectuals it's like okay cool man like you can't have two intellectuals in one funky podcast like somebody has to keep it going you know and, and you know david he tries to keep it going you know but like he's not me you know right. it's not the same he's mm-hmm. like he's european this is dominican it's mm-hmm. a different style mm-hmm. you know Whatever. dara and berkey they're kind of similar because they're both like athletes that turn into like intellectuals and stuff and it's like okay yeah whatever listen if me and me and david want to duke it out we can do it you know that's all i'm gonna say anyway like subscribe help our channel leave a comment below let us know, are you in Dogecoin? Do you think Elon is going to uh, say Dogecoin? And if, uh, you know, what do you think about the lumber price? It's just bananas right now. Anyway, with that said, peace.